Namaste. I'm Johannes Broadwell and I'm here at Agile India with Todd Little. And uh, Todd gave three talks at the conference this year. Uh, I watched your talk on the first day, Todd, so uh, could you summarize what it's about? Uh, so it was uh, our experience at Halliburton and Landmark um, in dealing with offshore teams and some of the uh, uh, challenges and successes we had in dealing with um, some offshore teams, uh, some of the activities we specifically went through to try to make it work well, some of the rethinking that we had to go through, um, some of the challenges in, that we had uh, in particular working uh, with India as well as some of the successes we've had in, in working with India. Um, this actual uh, particular experience that we had was actually pulled back from India because we couldn't find domain expertise that we needed. Uh, so we worked with a uh, work finding the right talent first, and, and then once we found the right talent, we made some uh, some great successes with uh, some companies in Romania and, and uh, Vietnam. All right. So I guess that the first question when it comes to um, going with global teams is uh, why would you want to do it? Well, a couple of reasons. One, obviously, there's a cost of damage that we were looking at, and, and that was one of the one of the uh, uh, drivers. Uh, the other was though that we couldn't find the talent. Uh, we were having difficulty finding the talent globally. So um, I'm in the petroleum engineering business, um, and so one of the things we needed was access to to petroleum engineers. Uh, the petroleum industry has been booming. The, this particular time we were doing this work was in the late 2000s, and it was very difficult to find petroleum engineers anywhere in the world. They were, they were, they were being snapped up all over the place. That was actually the reason we had to pull it back from India. We we kept trying to get petroleum engineers in India. We, Think we'd get them, and then, and then they'd be snapped up in some other organization. So, so <laughs> it just didn't work. So we had to go find find some in another location. Romania happened to be a place that that had a, uh, uh, we had a good connection to a uh, former petroleum engineering professor, and he was able to uh, uh, pull in some some of his contacts from the university. He had a software company, he pulled them together, and they were very very good uh, talent for us to work with. So yes, it, some of the lesson from that manifesto rings true even here, that it's about the individuals and interactions. Oh, oh, absolutely. It was about the individuals' interactions. It was about creating autonomous teams that could do the work. Uh, so this team, the, one of the reasons we felt we really had to have the domain experience, not just software experience, was they needed to understand the business and they needed to be able to communicate at a high rich level. So our team in Houston would really speak the language of petroleum engineering to the team in, in Romania. And then we had a team in Vietnam which was doing automation testing, and they could be speaking in a language of automation testing. And, and so um, it really was a decomposition, and those people could work autonomously, deliver results, and, and it worked out very well for us. We had uh, significant improvement in our overall test coverage. We were able to uh, uh, reduce our, our overall defects that we found in beta significantly, and then by the time we actually shipped, we, we were able to capture almost all the beta defects. So almost like a 97% reduction in, in defects, in known defects that we shipped with. So, so how did you get that reduction in defects? Part of it was in, uh, looking at our overall test strategy as well. So the, the entire team looked at our test strategy and figured out where we needed to fill in the gaps. And then we, we also then, based on the extra work we had to do, we leveraged these offshore teams, uh, built in additional test automation, working with a test automation specialist. One of the challenges we had being in such a, a specialized domain, uh, most of our testers were focused on petroleum engineering domain. They weren't automation specialists. Right. So we went and looked for a talent that had automation specialty, and that would happen to be a company in Vietnam. So that's how we were able to, that's the, the essence of it is we need to talent. Why not? Why look just locally? Right. Let's look globally. So you had specific need for very specific talent and you found it wherever you could. We found it wherever we could, and then we worked to see what we could do to think globally, to optimize it globally. One of the things we had was initially everyone was complaining because the build time was at a, the master build was at a specific time. We had multiple builds, you know, semi continuous integration, but the master build was, was a specific time. Based on that time, the team in Vietnam couldn't actually finish their work. In time, so we said, well, "What if we reinvestigate how we're doing? Well, let's look at our times. Mm -hmm. We change the build time. By that way, the Vietnam team could download, have the, the build available to them in their morning. They could run the automation test during their day. By the time they were done, the the uh, Romanian team would actually have the petroleum engineers that would investigate 
um, if there are any false positives, to actually do the engineering analysis of the test results. And then by the, the morning time in Houston, the Houston team would know, is this a decent build or not? So we turn a problem, which was a time shift, into an advantage. Right, so the code would ship around the world. The code shipped around the world, but it, but I think in the early days people thought about code shifting around the world from a factory perspective. Right. That I do development and then they do development, they do develop. It was a different, each one had their own compartment that was actually made sense for their skills that they had. I found that there's similar effect when I worked closely with a team from Europe to um, Asia, mm -hmm. uh, that we have three or four hours overlap that was actually a huge help for us too. And that, that is almost perfect because then you have some time for yourself and you have some time together. Yeah, that actually worked to our advantage as well. Having two locations yeah. um, worked because the team in Romania was the intermediary that had the overlap. We had almost no overlap with the Vietnamese team. It's almost 12 hour difference between Houston and, and uh, Vietnam. Between Vietnam and Romania was four hours. Right. And then between Romania was eight hours to Houston. It actually worked out very well because the Romania team could be sort of the central team that could be the, the intermediary, and, and then that worked out to our advantage. And so did you talk about other um, examples of teams as well in your talk? Uh, we had other issues. I, I, I went through some of the challenges of, that we hit in outsourcing. Uh, one of the big challenges that, that we hit being in a very specialized industry, uh, petroleum engineering, uh, we rely heavily on, on customer data. Um, customers are very sensitive about their data. Right. And so they don't like that data getting in the hands out. They really didn't even want us to have it, but they were, <laughs> they were our partners, so they, they, they let us work with it. And then you know, they felt good about that, but they didn't really like getting outside our building. So, so that was a big challenge. So uh, one of the issues we had to work with is realize that's going to be a challenge. So we had to create some synthetic data that tried to synthesize many of the types of problems we were seeing. But that was our test data that we would use for... Uh, for remote teams. Um, I think that's an issue that many people face in many industries. It, like yeah, I've, I've talked to many well. other industries. You know, banking has sensitive data. Yeah. Um, uh, pharmaceuticals as well. Every, every, yeah, each one has a little bit different nuance of the same pro type of so, problem. So how would you summarize the keys to success? Uh, a couple of keys to success. One, one is I think that the, uh, you need to set the offshore teams up to have autonomy. And that was a big, big part of the, the talk. I went into the, uh, the issues of how to create autonomy and how to create ownership mm -hmm. um, and, a, and, a, and making sure that the teams are aware of purpose and have all of the, the, research, all of the uh, capabilities that they need in order to do that. So in particular, like our Romanian team had petroleum engineering expertise. That helped them be able to deliver on that. They didn't have to ask us a lot of questions. They could, do, they could make all the mi micro decisions that they're making on a daily basis. Right. They didn't have to wait for us to, to give them uh, direction. And even if they made a wrong decision, we could then talk about it and, right. and fix it. So, so that's one of the, I think that's a key part is, is autonomy. Uh, I think another part is transparency and honesty. Um, that was perhaps a little controversial because I threw it out there, some of the challenges we had dealing with some of our um, Indian vendors where we don't always get with, with the um, cultural issues of hierarchy and, and uh, some of the challenges of, of uh, home, I think, afraid of telling the truth sometimes, so mm -hmm. that it doesn't always come out as, as direct as, we, as uh, it could be. Uh, I encouraged them to re really, and I encouraged my teams to be just frank and honest, and, and uh, you know, some things I tell my, my local teams that if they're not getting the code quality they want, they need to go back to the, to, the, to the remote teams and tell them that, and I'm telling my remote teams that when they're really mature, they'll be telling my local teams that their code isn't good and right. up to the quality. So, so those are some of the, the, the challenges. Uh, there's also the challenge, uh, oftentimes people are afraid of their jobs, there's what I call xen the xenophobia effect, you know, they're afraid of dealing <laughs> with foreigners. So that would be a more of an issue in the United States, I guess. Probably, although you, know, you never know, maybe the Romanians are afraid of the Vietnamese, or who knows, <laughs> who knows? but, uh, but uh, yeah, it's all, it's a, my view, I mean, I'm a global citizen, I deal with everybody, and, and it's about, it's about working, working as a as a global, um, you know, working with global talent, working with people. I enjoy meeting people from all over the place. Yeah. So your second talk was on one of one topic that I find to be quite interesting myself, which was uh, estimation. Estimation, yes, absolutely. Uh, and the title was uh, myth busting. Myth, myth busting, yeah. So that's a, there's a uh, 
TV program in the U.S. that uh, some physicists that, uh, that go together and they create Actually, they're special effects guys from, from movie industry. Awesome. Yeah, they're, they're, they're great guys, yeah. And they, and they take a various myths in the industry and, and take a look at whether they're, uh, those myths are so real what? myths or are they uh, just uh, myths. <laughs> so what are the myths of estimation? So many of the myths, I think there's, the, 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 one of the biggest myths is the, uh, the cognitive dissonance between the reality of software estimation and, and what many people expect estimation to be capable of doing. Uh, many people turn, believe that estimation should be very easy, that it should be very precise. Um, the reality is that particularly early in projects, um, the, the, the range of, of uh, potential error in, in estimation is huge. Um, uh, very, very frequently, I've looked at a lot of data very frequently, uh, and this has been repeatedly reported in, in, uh, in journals, uh, it's, it's not unusual, it's in fact fairly common to have uh, ranges from uh, 1 to 4 um, between 10% to 90% probability of success. So way higher than, than what uh, so it's most management would expect. Right. So it really, and but doesn't it even out? So you estimate one thing higher and one thing lower, and it even out. Well, the problem is that one to four. It's sort of a. It, it turns out that it's a log normal, and log normal ends up being um, having long tails, which means that if I'm at well, first of all, the other side of it is that we tend to be uh, horrendously optimistic in this industry. So while it's a one to four. We typically estimate the one, <laughs> which, right. means, which means the mean is a two, <laughs> and it means the median is even a little more than two. <laughs> so, so uh, because of these long tails, so, so there's some really dangerous, uh, dangerous zones in terms of what people look at. I mean, pe people know that scope creep is is likely, but they don't estimate. They don't include it. They they, um, um, mm. they, they basically work from a, a, a wishful thinking model. So the what? first the first myth I guess was around um, the feasibility of predicting. The, the first myth, myth is around what's realistic even in terms yeah. of the range of the, the range. Does does general management under, does general management and even the team understand the limitations of their estimates? You know, and is and, and I think it's you know almost every general manager I've come across thinks that we should be able you know, thinks that people should be able to estimate within plus or minus twenty five percent. But they're the, not. <laughs> that's, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. The only way it happens is by, by some sort of mandate or by, by constraining other things. You can do it. There are ways to get estimates to come out right, but it's usually by, by manipulating other things in order to get there. Now, are those good things to manipulate? Maybe. Right? Maybe it is a matter of adjusting scope and, and, and working in order to get that happen. Uh, what's not good is by um, cutting scope that actually reduces value substantially or by cutting quality which also reduces value substantially. So it sounds like, but it does sound like if there's one thing that you can do in order to keep your estimate, it is to cut scope. The, Usually that's the thing, the, the most, uh, that's the most appropriate. You just don't want to cut scope that's fundamental to uh, delivery right. of value. It, it, you know, sometimes we, I think, it, even in the Agile community say, well, the date's given, so we're going to cut scope in order to deliver that. That may not be the right answer. Yeah. Right? I mean, a huge, huge example I give from uh, the Ford Taurus. The Ford Taurus, the first release of it was hugely successful. But they did all the right things. They did all the customer surveys. They did all the um, interactions. They did multiple iterations in order to make sure that they were delivering the product they wanted. But they were six months late. Fired the project manager because they were six months late. Oh. Hugely successful product. <laughs> Saved the company. <laughs> Made lots of money for Ford. Right. Fired the project manager. Second rev of the Ford Taurus. <laughs> project manager made sure he shipped on time. Cut corners every place he could because he was going to make sure it cut on time. No user surveys, no multiple iterations, everything cut, cut to, to make sure he met the time. Yeah. Not very successful. <laughs> so success is about more than, than uh, matching the budget. Well, it's rare. I mean, we made such a big deal in our industry about it meaning to match the budget or yeah. to meet the time. We're stupid. If, yeah. that's the, <laughs> if that's how we're operating, it's stupid. I think I heard that the Sydney Opera House was about four times cost overrun or something like that. Wouldn't be surprised, yeah. But I mean, if you look at the it's impact. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful <laughs> impact, yeah. No, exactly. So, and, and I think, you know, things like the, the Big Dig in Boston was huge overruns. But 
you want to get it right if you're going to do it, right? <laughs> now, maybe it was a mistake was doing it in the first place, but if you're going to do it, you better make sure you get it right. Yeah. yeah. So what are some more myths in, uh, about uh, estimation? Um, one of the myths is, is sort of a myth, sort of not a myth. Uh, relative estimation um, is, uh, we in the Agile community, you know, there's a lot of people in the Agile community who say that relative estimation is so much better, it's the right answer. Um, it turns out that relative estimation is no worse or better than, 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 uh, than linear estimation. The one thing that, that is true, though, is that velocity is a great tool for correcting the biases that we have in, in other. So the both relative estimation and, in, and, and just linear estimation against some other norm uh, are both subject to anchoring problems, which is that once I have a number I'm, and I do something relative to that, I'm biased by my what I'm doing it relative to. Mm -hmm. um, so both of them have the same type of problem. The, the, great, the important thing is that velocity can correct for some of those biases. Um, and in re when we do relative estimation, we almost always do velocity. The problem is that people that don't do relative estimation, maybe you just do, do hours or day, ideal days or something like that, you're stuck with this concept of ideal day, which has its own connotation. So when someone hears it, they're not willing to correct an ideal day divided by velocity to turn it into some other day. So right. the units get messed up. So just for um, audience who might not know it, how do you do relative estimation just to... So relative estimation is choosing some base story as saying this is, a, this is a two. This is some story point number that I'm going to use as two. And then I'm going to estimate all my stories relative to that, to that number. Um, it, it's fine. It's an okay answer. But I think there's many in the Agile community who say we're, that, that we're particularly good at doing that when the evidence shows that we're actually not any particularly better at doing that than, than mm -hmm. we are not having that relative perspective. I looked over some of my um, previous projects and I found that everything was a 3, a 5, or an 8, which is, which is within the range of uncertainty that you have anyway. Correct, yes. So I, and I found that the, the 3s often turn out to be bigger than some of the 8s, so I, I realized that in this project it wouldn't have made a difference if I had estimated yeah. at all. Correct, and that's to, so the basis of my final one, my final myth was, are we wasting time doing estimation at all? And, and uh, I consider that to be plausible. I think many people spend way too much time um, and, and get co so wrapped up in, in doing estimation and they lose, they lose uh, principle as to what it's, why are they trying to estimate. And I think the first thing you always have to do, no matter what you're doing, is ask why. Yeah. So why am I estimating? Am I estimating in order because to... the customer asks me to? <laughs> Maybe it is, and in which case you have to decide: is that... <laughs> am I doing it for the customer, and they and they have to do it? Too. But does the customer even know why they want it? <laughs> Probably not. Well, probably not. So, so um, yeah, those are all the questions. So I think I think we. So, so we why often do people want to estimate? So I think there's a couple of core business reasons, right? One is they're trying to figure out approximately when are they going to be done. If it's a product company, they're trying to look at, at marketing efforts and when do they need, I mean, are they going to be done in a particular time window? They're trying to look, should we even do this project? Uh, is it, is it uh, economically viable? I mean, do we need to add more people? Is that a question we need to look at? Um, you know, they also, um, the other reason uh, for estimation, and this is the part of estimation that often gets ignored, is the fact that we're coming up with value. We're doing estimation on value too. And prioritization is really looking at a, um, a value per, per unit cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think often within, you know, when we look at it, we say, well, the product owner is going to do the, the, the prioritization. Well, they're only looking at one side of it. They're only looking at the, the valuation side. Um, with, which also has huge uncertainties, probably even larger uncertainties than you know, gener generally than, than on the cost side. Um, I like to get the team together and look at a combination of value and cost and do some quick, quick analysis of value over cost because that gives us a good perspective on, on where the priority, what we should be looking at for prioritization. So that's one of the things I want to, you know, some quick estimation and whether I'm doing that quick estimation purely on value or, or um, including the cost side. I mean, in the case where you said where almost all your stories are fitting between six, or between three and eights, you may not have to look, worry about the cost side at all. They're they're sort of all within that. Just call everything a five, and you'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, that's that's the other thing I'll tell teams. I mean, if if you really feel like you're wasting time on 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 estimation, 
but because you you know some corporate policy, you need to do something. Just call everything a two, everything a five. It doesn't really matter, right? That's, that may get you through the system, right? Yeah. Or maybe insert some randomness in there to, <laughs> in order to uh, make them feel good. So those when you look at those questions like um, market window, um, profitability, um, budgeting for the size of the team, mm -hmm. and uh, prioritizing, those are questions that require different kind of answers, right? Absolutely, and, and sometimes different people too, right? Because you're, you're, and so you may engage different people than are normally engaged in the estimation process. So, yeah, I, 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 and um, I encourage my teams to, to bring in the, you know, the right level of people and the right types of people in, in trying to make sure they understand why they're doing what they're doing, what business problem they're trying to answer by what they're doing, and then buy into it so they own it all together. Great. Yeah. Um, are you ready for the lightning round? The lightning round? Awesome. <laughs> Let's go. All right. So in the lightning round, I'll ask a question, and uh, you'll answer the question, and when you've answered it, you will ding the bell. Okay. So will you, do you want to try it? Ah, that's good. Brilliant. All right. So um, we didn't get time to discuss your other uh, your last talk, but you'll get a chance to explain it quickly. So what are our real options? So real options are the right, but not the obligation, to take some action before an expiration date. Very good. And uh, is estimating an hours wrong? Not necessarily. <laughs> and um, it's not evil. How should how do you fail with a global team? Very easily. <laughs> <laughs> if if I want to make it fail, it's not hard at all. <laughs> So what would the, be the first step to fail with a global team? Oh, um, don't, uh, don't, provide, don't let them have any autonomy and um, basically make it almost impossible for them to, know, to, to deliver on, on what they, they want. It's very easy. It, no can shut off communication, uh, just uh, give them piecemeal work, um, they'll fail almost every time. What's the best way to fail a local team? Um, that's an interesting one. Um, Would it be the same? Probably, but it's just different nuances. <laughs> just yeah, you know, because it's it's more subtle, right? You know, with a with a remote team, shutting off communication is so easy, and and uh, and in usually with the remote team, there's there's one team that has has more strength than the other, so that's that's an easy way to, to shut that down so if you shut down communication the team will fail but it's so much easier to shut it down when you're working global correct yes yeah because communication it takes work to make global teams work you've got to um, put effort into it um, you've got to really treat them as a partner as an extension and, and have ownership so you have to have ownership across the board of the end goal and local teams have to have their own ownership and autonomy in order to be able to be effective and productive. Thank you very much. Awesome.